Welcome, welcome, welcome to this whole life action hour. I am Ocean Robbins, co-founder, CEO, and host of Food Revolution Network. And I am thrilled to be with you right now with my dear friend, John McMahon, who is, uh, well, he's a living legend. Uh, you're gonna hear more about him in a second. But first, a little bit about what we're up to. Today, we're gonna focus on diabetes, pre-diabetes, blood sugar, and how it all plays out in your body so that you can get practical, actionable tools and insights and tips to help you have a balanced blood sugar levels and vibrant, healthy life. So you're gonna learn a lot today from a man who has walked the talk and lived the talk. Uh, he's been through um, being on death's door, really. Uh, and he's come back and said, no, thank you. I'm not ready to die. I'm here to live. And he's an inspiration to so many of us. Um, first, a little context. Diabetes is a worldwide epidemic. Rates of it have quadrupled since the 1980s. We had 108 million cases in 1980. We have 425 million right now. For every person who's diabetic, several more are in pre-diabetes and they don't even know it yet. But cutting edge research has shown us that with changes to your diet and your lifestyle, diabetes and other blood sugar imbalances can be prevented. They can even be reversed. So we're here today to talk about that and to share some solutions, some insight and some wisdom you can put into practice. You're gonna find out about different types of diabetes. There are more than just type one and type two. You're gonna find out about the symptoms of blood sugar imbalances, the link between obesity and diabetes, and what you can do to put health into action in your life. So now a little bit about our incredible guest, John McMahon. In early 2017, uh, shortly before I first met him, John had a, a diabetic heart attack and he was suffering from diabetes, neuropathy and morbid obesity. He'd been struggling with depression and isolation for years. Uh, doctors told him the best he could hope for was to manage his diabetes and deterioration with a cocktail of medicines that he would have to take for the rest of his life. John said, no, thank you. He embarked on a quest to get to the heart of the problem underlying our epidemic. And he wanted to learn how people could be successful at reversing it without medication. He set off on an epic quest. He interviewed some of the top diabetes and health and blood pressure and blood sugar and vitality experts on the planet, myself included. He traveled all over the world with a camera. He wanted to learn and he wanted to share his learning with others. I got to meet John when he was in the depths of his crisis. He could barely walk. He was morbidly obese. He was uh, struggling to survive. Since then, he has applied what he learned. He lost over 100 pounds, reversed his diabetes. He's been reclaiming his life, and he's become an inspiration to millions. He's the creator of the popular nine-part documentary series, I Thrive, Rising from the Depths of Diabetes and Obesity. And his transformation continues to inspire millions of people around the world through the I Thrive community, which he has founded. Now, let me be clear with you, this is not medical advice. We're offering coaching, inspiration, and sharing our stories. As in all things, use your own best judgment, and for all medical issues, consult with a qualified healthcare professional. So, John, so glad to have you here, welcome. Oh, thanks, uh, thanks, Ocean. It's such a good, it's a good time to be hanging out with you. It's good to see you. Uh, miss you. The time goes by so quickly. You know, the last time seeing you at your home, your beautiful home, hanging out. But uh, it's good to connect with you again. I'm happy to share, um, happy to share my insights uh, with other people, and hopefully they find some inspiration and hope that uh, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Absolutely, and you can do it, and you are doing it. And let's talk about that for a second, because your story is so extraordinary. So I shared a little bit, but fill in the picture a little bit more for us. Uh, what was life like? What kind of challenges were you facing around the time we met? Yeah, well, the, the first challenges were the advanced neuropathy. You know, that really started, that was a real wake-up call, not being able to feel my feet. I burnt them in a fire, um, in a bonfire, hanging out around at the beach with, uh, with friends. And I just had been holding my feet up, up to the fire, just like anybody would at night. You know, you kind of stick your feet up and you kind of warm them and like that. Yeah. And uh, got second, third degree burns. Didn't even know they were burnt until I got home. You know, it was dark and I got home in the light and uh, my, my sandals were all bloody and, and uh, it was just, it was a nightmare and I couldn't feel anything. And, um, and that, that was a real wake up call. And another friend, you know, he called me and he was trying to get me to, to be healthy for so long. And, um, 
and I would, he'd say, you know, how are you doing? How's your health? Uh, what did you eat today? And checking in. And, and finally he just said, I give up. I'm done with you, John. Um, you know, I care about you more than you care about yourself. And he said, you got to decide if you want to live. Mm, and so wow. that's what this is all about. You know, you got to decide if you want to live. And he, and he asked, you know, do you want to live? Yeah. And, um, and I, and I paused, I didn't, I had realized that my actions were not those actions of someone that wants to really live. So, um, this started this journey, you know, of really, really wanting to live yeah. and say, man, I got to do something and I got to do it fast. And, um, so started the journey of, uh, of interviewing, of gathering knowledge, gathering information, and, and I'm wanting to share my journey with others as it was happening, not after it happened. So yeah. that's, yeah. that's, you know, I ended up not knowing anything about cameras or photography or videography or production or editing. And I just talked to a couple of people for a couple hours, grabbed a camera and just went on the road and started documenting my journey and interviewing these amazing people in, in this space. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm thinking about the fact that you were not sure if you wanted to live. And I'm thinking that part of the question had to be what kind of life you would live. And it's a bit of a vicious circle. You know, the more you make choices that don't support health, the less appealing life is. And well, it doesn't feel like you even have a choice. You know, when you're stuck down in that, that level of food addiction with the standard American diet, it's hard to even imagine not eating anything else. It's hard to imagine not having pizza or not having cheese or not going through drive through not having a milkshake or not having fries it's, or not having candy bars, uh, you know, or pastas or a croissant or sandwiches or anything like that. It's, it's unfathomable, you know, and it looks like it's uh, you know, like I could never give that up. I could never do that. I could never stop eating and name your favorite food, right? Right. Uh, so it's a daunting it's a daunting uh, mountain to face when you're first, you know, we get educated on what we really, you know, thrive on as far as whole, you know, whole plant foods. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's talk about diabetes for a minute because you're dealing with a whole host of challenges, but that was really at the epicenter of it. Um, help us understand what is diabetes and what are the different types? Well, diabetes uh, on the surface is recognized as just having a chronic high blood sugar. And, uh, in, and there are several different types of diabetes, and it's not well understood. And later we'll talk about the real cause of diabetes, which is insulin resistance. But just at a, at a, uh, from an oversight level, you've got what, type 1 diabetes, type 1.5 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and type 3 diabetes. Um, and these all relate to the ability of the pancreas uh, to produce insulin and for the cells to accept insulin um, and be able to process and take in the sugar that's in the bloodstream and the mechanisms that are involved there. It's, it's very poorly understood and very poorly communicated out to most people. Um, but the type 1 diabetes is typically considered um, genetic um, but, uh, what we're finding now as an autoimmune response, you have, there's a genetic component for what we can see is like juvenile type one diabetes. And, um, the genetic component really looks like that may be triggered or expressed by dairy. And it's a huge alarm out there. Yeah. And actually it's not well publicized that, you know, like the numbers are like one out of 10 children may have a genetic predisposition to be able to be triggered by that pr uh, protein, that case in protein and dairy. And they are advised. There's a, there's actually medical advisory out there until they're 10 years old, you know, don't feed your children dairy, but you don't hear that. Do you, you hmm. know, you didn't hear that from anybody. And in fact, there are some of the experts that I did interview that had some success in catching some of these children early on in this autoimmune response and save them turn their type one diabetes around. It's, it's amazing. So there's cutting edge research going on right there and hope for those that where we think type one is just this sentence that that's it for the rest of your life. But that for right now, it, uh, it's that, that genetic expression in the pancreas and autoimmune response is stopped really producing insulin. And um, it, it basically attacks the beta cells that produce the insulin that you need to be able to process the sugar in the blood. Now type, we'll skip type one and a half, I'll come back to that. Type two diabetes is, is um, 
lifestyle related. It's actually generated or caused by the increase of fat in your body, fat in your cells, fat in your body where it's not supposed to be in your muscle cells and other cells. And it, it clogs up the receptors for insulin to be able to, to be able to process and unlock the keys for glucose to be able to enter the cell and be processed there. And, and it's saturated fat in particular, animal fat more specifically. And the buildup of that causes all kinds of problems um, vascularly in your, in your system. And when that blood sugar can't enter the cells, the pancreas has to produce more and more and more insulin to force itself into that lock, to squeeze it, you know, to open it up. And so for a long time, what will happen is the pancreas can be overcompensating <coughs> to make your blood sugar normal and to process it normal. So if the blood sugar is all you're testing, you think everything is fine. Mm -hmm. Everything is fine. And you nobody's doing, nobody's doing extended multi-hour insulin response tests. We'll talk about that later. But the main thing is in type 2 diabetes, what has happened is over years of abuse and neglect uh, for lifestyle and, and food, you're, you're, your cells have become so gummed up that now the body, the pancreas cannot produce enough insulin to be able to open up that lock. And the doctor will see that as this elevated blood sugar. And, uh, and over say several months, they'll measure this um, in a process called a, the a, well, hemoglobin A1C, which over time it will, it will measure like how often your, your it's basically, it's basically a record of how often your, blood sugar has gone over or above and it's caused, you know, like a sugary effect on your cells and it leaves this marker behind that yeah. they can measure to see, um, uh, you know, how, how, how high your blood sugar has been. So all of these things are just symptoms of the cause. Now in type two diabetes, of course, that's what I had that is, can be uh, stopped and reversed with lifestyle. Now we'll step back to type one and a half diabetes. Because what will happen is a person with type 2 diabetes, if they go un, really untreated, if they don't treat the root cause, and I'm talking about the root cause, not just lowering your blood sugar, but the root cause, which is insulin resistance. Yeah. What will happen is that the pancreas will be, is overworked. It's beaten like a donkey or a horse that's just running, running, running. And it, it will get to the point where it can no longer produce the, the insulin that it needs to produce. And it will lack the capacity and it will, it will be permanent damage to the pancreas. And that's actually what some of these medicines do. Yeah. They would just squeeze the pancreas and they drive it hard and they make it work 16 hours a day, 18 hours a day, 20 hours a day and work, you know, at 110% capacity. And finally it just gives up and it's done. And all of a sudden you're type one and a half diabetic and you're all, what in the world happened to my pancreas? I've been mm -hmm. taking the medicine. I've been controlling my blood sugar. It's a nightmare. Yeah. Um, you don't, you do not want to go down that road. Now type three diabetes. Now uh, some of the experts I talked to now have been doing cutting edge research in Alzheimer's and, you know, type D, di di diabetes is a vascular disease where you're basically, um, uh, choking yourself off from the nutrients in your blood supply from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. It's a disease that affects every single system, subsystem in your body because it's the core thing that transports oxygen, blood, nutrients everywhere. So um, type 3 diabetes is, is now uh, basically they're calling it diabetes of the brain. About 80% of Alzheimer's they're looking at being the same as basically type 3 diabetes. The diabetes are calling it type 3 diabetes. And so there you go. It, it affects every system in the body. So that's, that's the types of diabetes and kind of what diabetes is on the surface, you know, the high elevated blood sugar, yeah. but uh, underneath we'll talk about insulin resistance, which is the actual root cause. Yes. Thank you. Very helpful to have some context there. And I just want to say for everybody who's with us right now, it may not actually have diabetes in your life. Stay with us regardless, because number one, you probably know people who are dealing with this. And if you don't, you will because prediabetes affects um, you know, several times more people than diabetes does. So we're talking worldwide about over a billion people right now who are suffering from prediabetes. Yeah. And, uh, if you you think know, and most of them are undiagnosed and don't even know it. Yeah. And so 
you know, you can have the extreme symptoms, but pancreas working too hard in order to produce lots of insulin, which is the condition you're describing, this affects huge numbers of people right now. And um, so let's talk about the root cause here. Okay, I like to get right into that. Because um, a lot of people say, oh, blood sugar levels are too high. The key thing is don't eat sugar. And that's, that's great. I mean, there's a lot of reasons not to eat sugar. But then people say, okay, but carbs turn into sugar, right? They turn into glucose in the body, some faster than others. So the key thing then is to not eat carbs if you want to bring your biomarkers down and bring your blood sugar levels down, right? And yet, obviously, that's not the whole story, right? So what's wrong with that approach? Why wouldn't somebody who's worried about their blood sugar levels want to stop eating or reduce their consumption of their precursors to sugar? Well, look, it's kind of like having a car that's got four flat tires and you leave it in the garage. And your solution to the car that having four flat tires is not to drive it, okay? It's, that's the problem. The, the high yeah. blood sugar is a symptom of insulin resistance. It is not the problem. And so when you try to aggressively control uh, blood sugar, especially with medicine, it is an ineffective treatment of the disease. There are study after study after study that show that it has no result in mortality, morbidity, and controlling the complications of diabetes through aggressive control of blood sugar management. That's clear. Nobody's debating that. Um, and so that's, that's really the, the misunderstanding. It's not about controlling your blood sugar kind of artificially by not eating carbohydrates or fruit or anything like that. It's about getting the body, the whole body is supposed to be able to process sugar. And that's the real test that you need to take. And getting back to pre-diabetes, I just want to say one more thing. You know, if you think, if you're skinny and you know, you think you're off the hook or you, you think you're, you have your blood sugar tested, you think you're off the hook? No, no way. Um, it's, it, the numbers are more like 80% of the American population has prediabetes. Okay. Wow. How are you, how is that defined? Well, I'll tell you what, that if well, Dr. Wes Youngberg basically is, is pioneering some work in prediabetes and also type three diabetes, but the, the way that it's being tested now to say you're diabetic, let's say with a A1C of say 6.5. Those are way too high. If by the time you got an, had an A1C of 6.5, you may have had diabetes for 5, 10, 15 years, pre-diabetes, okay? Yeah. The, the tests for that need to, need to be kind of recalibrated across the board. Because like we said, for a long time, the pancreas can be working overtime and you not even know, show any symptoms at all or any indication unless you specifically do an insulin resistance test you know, in response to a four hour glucose intake, you know, high glucose intake. Yeah. So you're supposed to be able to, to be able to have a whole bunch of sugar. I mean, a whole bunch of glucose, you know, like healthy sugar and your blood sugar not spike. That's the true measure of whether or not you have diabetes or prediabetes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Got it. Um, so you talked earlier about the uh, extended insulin response test. Yeah. What is that? And is that something you're recommending a lot of people do? It's essential. It's not a recommendation. You cannot treat this disease without measuring your glucose against your insulin resistance and your inflammation at the same time at a minimum. These are your minimum tests. And not one hour, not two hours, but to do it over four hours. So what happens is you go in for a fast with uh, fasting into the doctor's and over four hours, they will give you your fasting insulin, they'll give you a fasting glucose test, and then they'll give you a super sugary drink, like 75 grams of like, you know, just the sugary glucose you know, solution. And bam, and then they'll measure it one hour, two hours, three hours, and four hours. And, the, and you'll see the curves of insulin resistance and glucose resistance, and that will tell, paint the clear picture, because if the insulin is like way high, your blood sugar could still be normal and not showing or, or just slightly elevated. But all of a sudden to get it that to that level, your pancreas has had to produce an enormous amount of pressure as which is insulin in the system. So that's where you can get, and the curves can be wild indicating like all types of like different hormonal problems showing that, Hey, I'm producing uh, my, my, my insulin response is too quick or it's yeah. too late or it's, you know, 
it's that's what you need to be able to 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 start this problem before you started any kind of program i would recommend having that done so then you know what what your baseline is um, that's your baseline. is that something people can do just with their family doctor um or is there a yeah they can ask they can ask for that test they want a four-hour glucose response and insulin response and 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 measure your inflammation there at the same time okay so let's suppose that i do that test and i find out that um I've got some problems. Okay, I'm part of the 80% of the American public that has, you know, pre, is in pre-diabetes, right? Um, what's actionable? What's somebody to do if they get that result? Well, I mean, you want to, you really essentially want to be talking to a endocrinologist or a, at least a, a highly trained nutritionist that you, you need someone that understands nutrition because a, a regular doctor is going to really, depending on where you're at, if your blood sugar isn't high, they're not going to worry about it. So they're going to say literally, come back to me when you've got diabetes, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you, and then if I'll give you drugs. Food, and then I'll give you some drugs to artificially yeah. control it. So what you want to do is you want to talk to like a plant-based doctor or a naturopath or somebody that, that can develop a plan for you, a dietary plan for your individual needs um, and monitor it so that you can lower the fat in your body, lower the fat and clean out your system, clean out your cells so that that insulin can get in there cleanly. And you'll see it reverse and it will reverse very quickly. Yes. So, okay. So um, back to your story, because this is kind of, you, you went through obviously a, a rather extreme example, um, but we can learn from it a lot, right? So yeah. you changed your diet, you changed yeah. your lifestyle. What did you do? Well, um, I really was uh, a food addict, and I didn't even know, know the term until I had done the documentary series and found out that that was a real thing. It was, it was a relief when it was described to me, but um, I felt like I wasn't alone and I wasn't broken or wrong or bad a person. Um, yeah. But uh, really, really... Um, it was, it was hard for me to do this on my own. I ended up to kickstart something they call neuro taste adaptation, which is to just to get over the crave, the intense cravings for salt and sugar and fat, which was my diet was mainly fast food. Um, I went and did a long-term water fast. I did a 32 day uh, water only fast. And uh, I had the privilege of going, you know, to the true North health center there um, and, uh, and there I also got educated. So this is very important too, to get educated on, on health and nutrition and how to eat right, and how to cook right, and how to prepare things and how to stock my kitchen and how to clean out my pantry and how to, yeah. how to shop at the farmer's market and how to prep and eat, you know, things that are totally different, not a bowl of cereal with sugar in it for breakfast, but, you know, to eat greens and beans for breakfast, you know, and things yeah. like that. It was totally different. It's a totally different lifestyle. So the first thing was just a detoxification, you know, uh, effort, you know, so yours might be a juice fast or it could just be, you know, eating clean for a few days or whatever it is. It's just, it's a, just to detox, eat really, really simple for a, a small amount of time. And that will help yeah. get the, lower the salt uh, in your system, the salt taste that you're used to eating high salt, and high sugar, and, and start to really give yourself a chance to be able to uh, refeed and start eating clean. So then, then I started to apply the principles and I went home and I just uh, shopped at the farmer's market and started eating super simple meals. I ate, um, you know, I built my meals in my mind around this plate that looked like it was half green. You know, <laughs> yeah, and uh, and that's going to be a combination of raw greens and cooked greens, salad, um, cruciferous vegetables, you know, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, you know, kale, bok choy, that type of thing. I made sure I'm always thinking in my mind. I want to get my greens first, and then balance that out with legumes. Okay, so yeah. legumes are going to do all types of magical things and resistant starch, and even out my blood sugar and and. Uh, help clean out my cells from all the fat and then the non-starchy vegetables, you know, um, and then, and then fruit and, uh, and then, and then the whole grains and steel cut oats, uh, you know, and, and here and there once in a while, but that's kind of how I shifted my eating and just made it very, very simple. 
Yeah. Uh, and getting rid of the oil and uh, getting rid of the, you know, a lot, you know, a lot of the things, especially when I'm, when you're losing the weight and um, trying to get lower the diabetes numbers and all, all those numbers uh, really turn around very, very quickly. You lost over a hundred pounds. Yeah. In about nine months. In nine yeah. months. Okay. Yeah. I didn't so, weigh um, and measure. I didn't weigh and measure anything. I didn't yeah. count any calories. I wasn't perfect. I had times when I was, you know, went in the store and I was hungry and I was cranky and emotional and uh, I just wanted to numb myself out still. And I had, you know, I ate the, the bag of Doritos and the chocolate and whatever, but I got back on track right away. I had some kale juice or whatever, but you know, just, I wasn't perfect is my point. Um, but I still had tremendous results by just applying general principles. I didn't sweat over recipes. I didn't really make stuff with recipes. I just, you know, I'm a Buddha bowl kind of a guy, what's in the fridge. And I yeah. just know just vegetables and, and starch and vegetables and fruit and then some grain and put it together. And it just, it works. It does work. And there are an overwhelming body of studies that back up what you're saying. Yeah. This isn't it's just, just too many an anecdotal just... story. This is, this is normal. Yeah. Well, my own grandpa, Irvin Robbins, founded the Baskin Robbins Ice Cream Company, as many of our participants know. And, um, you know, he made a lot of ice cream and he ate the standard American diet. And then he was suffering from the standard American diseases. And at age of 70, he had serious diabetes and heart problems and weight issues, which often go together. And um, he was told he'd have to take a bunch of these pills for the rest of his life. And he did not like those side effects one bit. And he was not happy about it. But then he was blessed to have a doctor who gave him a copy of my dad's book, Diet for New America, and told him to read it. And my grandpa did, and he followed its advice, and he lost 30 pounds, and he got off all of his high blood pressure and diabetes meds, and his diabetes never came back. Uh, and his, you know, initially his doctors didn't even mention diet to him. They didn't think he would be compliant. Turns out they were wrong. And uh, I wonder how many doctors are focusing on drugs because they think nutrition is too onerous a task. Like people just won't follow through. Compliance is difficult. You know, it's easy to say if somebody's taking pills every day, it's much harder to say if they're eating well, because it's a, it's a um, lifestyle, you know, but um, as you've demonstrated, you don't have to be perfect mm -hmm. to, um, to uh, make progress and to get results. It's what you do 99% of the time that matters most, not, you know, whether or not it's 100%. Now, some people need bright lines, I think. You, an alcoholic can't have just one drink because they have one drink and it opens the door to a binge. And I think food can be like that for some folks. The more addicted you are, the more you need a bright line in order to break free. But uh, for a lot of folks, it's somewhere in the middle. It sounds like you're somebody who definitely struggled with, maybe still struggles with food addiction sometimes, and yet uh, you were able to kind of get it right most of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the bright lines are really important. Um, and even in spite of having those bright lines, I, I, was, I would still find myself in, in a binge but uh, get myself back on track. Um, you know, one of the things that I did was, uh, just to speak on food addiction a little bit, um, two things that I did. Whenever I would binge, I would, I would make sure not to fall into the trap of shaming and guilt myself, uh, feeling bad. I was really gentle with myself and I just kind of took a breath. But the first thing I would do is, even if I was full, I would say, I'm not, getting, I'm not getting back on track tomorrow. I'm getting back on track now. And no matter what, what I would do is I wanted to finish up that. I didn't want the lingering taste of that binge to be in my mouth. So I would immediately go have some really green, green anything, maybe some kale juice or some salad or whatever I can. If I couldn't, I'd have at least some whole natural food so that the last taste in my mouth was I'm back on track immediately. It didn't wait. It's not like, oh man, I wanna, I wanna lose the weight or get rid of the calories or I'm gonna starve myself tonight and not eat until noon tomorrow and that will make up for it. I didn't fall into any of those traps. The most important thing I wanted to do was get back on track and eating and being the lifestyle that I wanted and the weight and the diabetes would be side effects falling away from the lifestyle choice that I was making. 
And the second thing was is that I didn't fall into denial. I, I would always take a picture uh, with, my, with my phone of what I ate so that I didn't, for, I didn't forget or I wasn't in denial. And, and then I, and I would share that with somebody. I would have my accountability partner. I have my friend or my partner, you know, I've never heard of anybody doing that before. And it strikes me as brilliant. You just said it. it. And I thought, wow, if you literally had to take a picture of everything you ate, because you know, some people do food journals and I have to say, it's a little bit tedious to try to write it down. But if you take a picture, it's sort of a picture is worth a thousand words and it doesn't take long. And if you get in the habit, everything that goes in your mouth is going to be photographed and yes share it with somebody then there's that visibility that that's extraordinary you just it seems like you'd have to have no exceptions did you take pictures of the doritos uh well yeah yeah no i uh actually um i had was i would take a picture of a lot of my meals but not not all of i would take pictures of all my meals but when i if i binge if i cheat if i ate something that i knew wasn't for my serving my health the, my commitment to myself was is that I wouldn't fall into the trap of isolation because this yeah. is the type of thing that you you go by and you come back to your car you know and you just kind of eat in the parking lot or right. you're at home and you take home and you're by yourself and you're watching TV. I didn't want to have that, so I, I I took a picture and a recorded so I don't forget, but also sharing it. So if I binged, man, I shared it with my coach, my accountability partner. I shared that particular picture for sure, so that yeah. someone else knew. The way the end where there was no judgment, there was no shame. It was just, okay, this, this happened. I need to face it. And then, but I also needed to eat something clean right afterwards, immediately. Yeah. In that way. So those two little things, they, it really, it really helped me, you know? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's brilliant. So um, I want to come back to um, this core issue of fat and diabetes, yeah. and pre-diabetes. And you were saying earlier, and let me just simplify this and maybe oversimplify, but let me know if this is accurate, that essentially all the forms of diabetes have an issue with the body's ability to absorb blood sugar into the cells and, and the um, pancreas's ability to produce insulin and the relationship between those two things. And when um, the body is not able to absorb blood sugar adequately into the cells, the pancreas has to work overtime to to produce insulin in order to bring down blood sugar levels because insulin helps to balance the blood sugar. And um, so, and you're saying that fat in the wrong places in the cells can inhibit their ability to absorb the sugar naturally, which then causes it to build up in the bloodstream at higher levels. Is that a decent yeah, yeah, except for type type 1 diabetes. It, that applies for all of them except type 1. Okay, got it. All right. So um, then um, what then is the link between obesity and diabetes? I mean, it's so strong that you often use the term diabetes yeah. because it's a, it's a complex of issues. Metabolic syndrome is also another term that's often used, which has a lot in common, a lot of overlap with diabetes. Not everybody dealing with blood sugar imbalances or pre-diabetes is obese. Not everybody who has diabetes is obese, but most often there's a pretty strong correlation. So tell us more about that. Yeah, it's super highly correlated. Um, I mean, you're like 30 times more likely to get uh, diabetes uh, metabolic syndrome if you are uh, obese. So the correlation is high, but it's not a causation. So a a large population of the people that have uh, diabetes, say it's like 20 between, I can't remember, it's between 20, 30% are not obese, okay? And they have diabetes. They're fat on the inside out. Yeah. So uh, a lot of this is just uh, like body type. Most of us, if we are eating a fatty diet, uh, we wear our fat on the outside and on the inside. And some of us uh, are able to process a lot of those calories and excess calories and um, not have a lot of it on the outside. And, but on the inside, don't kid yourself. It's all building up. You're getting fatty liver disease. So if you just, let me just said it before, you know, if, you, if you're skinny and you think you're off the hook for diabetes, you're, you're not think again. In fact, it actually could be worse. You could have a worse case because you know, it, there's no outward, outward indication 
of, right. uh, of obesity. Yeah. Um, when diabetes progresses to a severe level, what happens? Well, it just gets ugly. You know, when, when you're making those choices that lead you down that road for diabetes, it's like you decided to, you know, um, have a heart attack. If you survive that, have a stroke, um, go blind, have your legs cut off and then die. Oh, oh, maybe have your kidneys removed for a while and be on dialysis for 24 months. Um, cause the average, or what is it? You, you've got about four years after you go on dialysis, um, until you're done. And, and the sad part is, you know, I worked in a dialysis ward when I was in college. I had no idea that I was going to end up being, you know, uh, with diabetes. But it is not something that you want any part of is to be on dialysis. So, um, yeah, it's not any of it that you want to look forward to. And uh, for, yeah. don't forget about Alzheimer's. So it's basically you're cooking yourself from the inside out. And by the time, by the time you start realizing, start having symptoms from the diabetes or complications from the diabetes, you've done a tremendous amount of damage to your body. It's been going on for years. And if you think you don't have to worry about it till you're 45, think again, think about worrying about it when you're 10 years old. Okay. So that's as early as when vascular disease is starting to show up. Now I sat with Dr. Neil Barnard, uh, president of the PCRM physicians committee for responsible medicine. And he's seeing that atherosclerosis, he's seeing pre-diabetes in people that are 10 years old and they're getting diabetes in their teens. Yeah. In high school, I had a lady approach me and tell me my daughter died of diabetes. She was 28 years old. Yeah. Okay. We used this to, whole used to generation. Call it adult, type 2 used to be adult onset diabetes. No. Because it Teenage. Was, anybody. It started, and, now, and now they've renamed it type 2 precisely because it's impacting teenagers now. Yeah. Ten, and... and, and and it's going to impact your choices in school. It's going to impact your ability to perform. It's going to impact your cognitive ability in high school, your grades, your job performance. All of that is already being statistically tracked that even your mating choices are going to be impacted. There's, there's a whole section in the documentary I did where a doctor walks through this fictional person that, he called, that we called Michael and we walked through his life as a young boy all the way through till he was 65 and all of the damage that was done and, and the quality of life and the ceiling that came down on him because of these dietary choices that sort of on the outside looked like the standard American life. And, yeah. And you see it from a whole different perspective. Okay. So that's terrifying. <laughs> I mean, I'm laughing, but um, you know, I, I'm so yeah. covered. Um, and kids, kids we don't can... have a chance. I know, you know? And a third of our kids are expected to get diabetes in their lifetime, but obviously, as you're saying, most of us are dealing with pre-diabetes statistically. So if someone's already facing it, let's talk about reversal, because that's something that you've documented and experienced. Um, and I want to turn now to some of the questions that have come in from our Whole Life Club members. Uh, Gail said, I want to know how John defines reversing diabetes. Is he able to manage blood sugar highs and lows, or does he even try? I understand that sugar should not rise higher than 20 points over the sugar level prior to ingesting a meal. Does he track this? If so, has he been able to stay within this range, and how does he do it? I would also be curious if he tracks his sugar before and after exercise and is staying within the 20-point range. I have managed to bring my A1C into acceptable levels without medication, from 11.8 to 5.1, However, my blood glucose is all over the board. For instance, today, an hour after eating a veg lunch, summer squash, Brussels sprouts, and sweet potato, my sugar shot up to 193. I don't know what to do. So how do you define reversing diabetes and any advice for Gail? Well, you know, what's interesting, I'll tell you, I talked to Dr. Goldhammer and he said, don't overfocus on postprandial blood glucose levels. Don't overfocus on that. The fact that you've got an A1C of 5.1, clearly shows that you have reversed your diabetes. You're in the, uh, you know, you're in a health, super healthy range. So um, as far as the postprandial meal being at 193, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I can't advise you on exactly on what you should do. And we'd have to look at, do some other tests. I know, uh, not we, but the doctor would do other tests. And one of those would be insulin resistance to see what it, your pancreas is doing what your history was, because if you had diabetes before, you could have a weaker pancreas, but essentially your A1C is telling you that you're, you're doing pretty good. 
And um, as far as, I'm not sure where, where that 20 point comes from, because I know you can have a, a, you know, a really low blood sugar number, but it can, like in fasting in the morning, and really the number that we're trying to keep it under is under, under the 120s, okay? That's really the number. So, I mean, if you're 70 and it goes up to 120, you know, that's fine. Now, how I define having reverse diabetes, it means that I can eat, a, I can eat it if I wanted to, a whole bunch of sugar and my blood sugar doesn't spike. That's reversing it completely. Now, my A1C is 4.6, okay? And when I drank that sugary drink, pure sugar, okay, my, it, my glucose level just went gently up. It didn't spike. It went gently up to 120 and then came right back down to 7. My, my fasting insulin was at 3, like 2.9, and then it went gently up on the same curve and trajectory as the glucose, and it came right back down to like 2.5. So that's, that is reversing it. The whole idea is that you can, you can um, ingest glucose and the body can handle it. Um, so that is how I define reversing diabetes. So what do you think Gail might um, be missing potentially that you would suggest she consider um, from her situation? Well, we'd have to know more of really what she ate during those meals, what she ate before, and know the insulin resistance test to know the health of her pancreas. It's very important to measure the health of her pancreas. And so her pancreas might be weak. She might be even not be producing because of damage and not enough insulin, but she's yeah. producing enough over on the average of all of her meals to have an A1C of 5.1. So one of the things that really helps even out that blood sugar, a couple things you can do, is make sure you mix some good legumes along with your meals. Anything with resistant starch, especially if it has been uh, left over, you know, it's like cooled down and it's been in the fridge and you take it out as leftovers. It's got this thing called resistant starch, which evens out the absorption, slows it down, coats the stomach and the lining so that these nutrients are more slowly absorbed into the body. Um, and so that's what you may need help with too, along with a simple little 12 minute walk, just a walk after your meal can, has dramatic impacts on your blood sugar curve after you eat. So those are two simple things you can do. And then also looking into measuring the health of your pancreas, uh, with the insulin resistance test. Got it. Thank you, John. Um, Carmen from Australia also had a question about reversal. Carmen said seven years ago, I lost feeling in both my feet due to peripheral neuropathy caused by a rare autoimmune disease, vasculitis. Anyway, I've regenerated my nerves and regained most feeling in my feet. I'm curious to know if John has had the same results. How are yeah. your feet doing? Yeah, my feet are doing, uh, it's slow. Remyelination of badly damaged nerves is a process that could take a, uh, a couple, two, three years. And that's certainly the problem with me. I had a constellation of issues with me, not just diabetic neuropathy, but I also had, <coughs> excuse me, I had a herniated disc, which actually created a nerve impingement in my lower back, L4 and L5, uh, because of that weight, all that weight, you know, carrying 110 pounds. That's like three of those big five, more, almost four of those big five gallon jugs of water. You know that you see? Try carrying just one of those and imagine carrying four of those and that's the back. So I've had a bit of a nerve impingement um, and uh, so that's been the problem. But I've had a nerve conduction study and just from the improvements of losing the weight and cleaning up my diet, the doctor has seen, and this is what you don't hear a lot from neurologists, they see a re -nervation. That's nerve growth. So um, that's, that's been really good news. So I'm getting nerve growth and it's progressing from my back down, finding its way down to my feet. And it's, it's about like almost down my left side, down to my knee. So um, just, just keep moving forward with that. Another thing is uh, there are, uh, watch, keep watch of your B12 levels, because if you're on a whole food plant-based diet, you wanna make sure those B12 levels are optimum. And there are also some creams, B12 creams, so there are some of us that even have absorption problems. Doesn't mean matter if we're eating meat or not or food or taking vitamin B12. <coughs> it 
and I'm one of those people, and they make a cream that bypasses the gastrointestinal tract, and they can absorb that B12 um, directly into the cells. And I, and I rub that on my feet and, uh, and on my hands as well. Got it. Thank you. Um, Cheryl said, I've been living a plant-based lifestyle for about a year and a half. I've lost 30 pounds and I feel so much better. The doctor tells me whatever I'm doing, keep doing it. She's no longer on me about my weight, cholesterol, and my blood levels are heading in the wrong, and my and blood levels heading in the wrong direction. But it seems now I have hit a plateau. Nothing has changed for me in months. Is this what happens or is there something else I can do to keep getting healthier? Do I need to change up something in my diet? I am getting exercise, though I can't run because of my knees, but I do walk as much as I can outside of working hours. So, um, you know, what are your thoughts? Uh, it seems like Cheryl made some changes and got some yeah. results and lost the 30 pounds, but then hit a plateau. Do you see that very often? And yeah, thoughts for Cheryl. Yeah, absolutely. Like I told you before, you know, I wasn't weighing or measuring or, or paying real strict or close attention to what I was eating. Um, but then that will take you down from this morbidly obese. It'll bring you down now to, and to get that last little part, you'd have to start paying attention. And the first place to look is start examining your oil and your nuts and your seeds. Okay. So just look at the fat and the high calorie sources that are coming in your diet. So are you, one of the things is, are you going to the fridge and, you know, I keep my nuts in the fridge, you know, to keep the oil uh, fresh. Uh, you know, nuts are full of oil. Um, do you go in there and just grab handfuls of nuts, you know, and, and <laughs> throw them down your gullet? Uh, yeah. Use nuts as a, as a condiment. And if you still want to have some weight to lose, you know, why don't you just, like, for a month, okay, just eliminate the nuts and the seeds. You'll be fine. Um, but the first thing I would go to is, uh, is oil. Really just look at how much oil am I really using? And let me go off that for a month, you know. Just, just try to cook and eat without oil for a month. So just start paying a little bit closer attention. The plateau's telling you that you've reached a level of equilibrium, um, that you need to, to just dial it in just a little bit tighter. Yeah, and um, I would say also, of course, it's hard to know without knowing exactly, you know, what Cheryl's doing, but um, most of us could do to eat more vegetables. And uh, oh, yeah, so a, lot of yeah, yeah. a lot of people also can do well to drop snacks out. <laughs> you know, I mean, everyone's different, but if you're dealing with excess weight and you want to lose a few extra pounds more, snacks are, uh, the average American gets about 500 calories a day from snacks. And we drink, I don't know, another several hundred calories. So if you choose to focus on drinking water and tea without sugar and not eating sweetened beverages and cutting out the snacks and just eating at actual meal times, and then making sure that you're eating a lot of vegetables, like see if you can double your vegetable consumption, seriously. Not, yeah. not like a half cup serving, but like four cups. <laughs> you know, I sometimes eat kale for breakfast. And, um, you know, and you don't need to slather it in a bunch of oil or so fancy sauces. You can start to, you try some ume plum vinegar or some sauerkraut on there. And, uh, you know, uh, th those are some of the steps that could be helpful, especially if, if it's a few extra pounds you're trying to get rid of. And then um, obviously exercise is important. Cheryl mentioned that she's unable to run, but she can walk. That's great. Um, keep at it. You want to get some cardio stimulation, though, something that gets your blood pumping a little faster and gets you out of breath, because that's, that's kind of some of the hormesis, that the stress response that stimulates your body to, to build muscle and to build vitality and to get things moving and circulating. And um, so if you can't run, then you, know, you might try some other methods, working out at the gym, getting your upper body going, um, maybe some other types of exercise that get you moving and grooving a little more um, enthusiastically, shall we say. Yeah, I, I, I take that for granted because I don't eat snacks and uh, that all I eat is vegetables. So like, yeah, that goes without saying. I'm glad you brought that up. It's, yeah. I can't believe it. After just a short period of time, I just don't do and all And I only drink water. So I was like, you know, oh, what else do you do? But, but yeah, obviously, you know, don't be eating vegan Oreo cookies and you know you got to get get rid of all the any type of uh, you know snack foods definitely for sure um, yeah that's a good one and even chair yoga just everything you know as you start to as I started to lose weight my body just wanted to move you know I didn't want to sit and so I'm thinking about movement in my mind all the time and even you know just am I moving my fingers I can move my arms I can I can just sit here and move my shoulders and I I can sit here and just kind of do this 
you know, and yeah. just roll, roll my head. And I'm, this, the body is made to move. And so I'm looking for opportunities to move and not be still all the time. Yeah, as you're talking, I'm wiggling my spine and I'm thinking yeah. about how, you know, sitting is the new smoking. And even when you're sitting, you can be completely locked or you yep. can be a little dynamic and, and moving and, and shifting and listening to your body's wisdom and energy is moving when you're doing that. And it keeps you alive and it brings you to life. So everybody watching right now, wherever you are, whether you're standing or sitting or moving around, just undulate your spine a little bit. Let yourself feel your body and feel your aliveness and know that this is part of it. This is how you bring yourself to life. Um, Monique said, I was just told I'm pre-diabetic. I'm trying to prevent a progression to diabetes. I've been trying to educate myself on the best lifestyle changes I can make in order to prevent diabetes. One diet has you eating no carbs before 4 p.m., but rather animal protein at lunch and dinner, since that's supposed to curb your appetite and have you eat less the rest of the day, and this then just a small amount of carb after four. This is not the way I eat, as I'm currently a pescatarian trying to eat in a more veganish way. I'm eating more fruits, vegetables, and beans, and way less eggs and dairy. My question is, since I've been reading about veganism, I see there are different schools of thought. There are those that emphasize vegetables, fruits, and beans with the addition of nuts, seeds, and avocados, and don't recommend the starchy foods. I'm confused in terms of which way is best. Don't grains and sweet potatoes turn into sugar, and doesn't that increase blood sugar? I personally feel more satiated when I eat some nuts, seeds, and avocado, but I've also read that fat, even vegetarian sources of fat, is bad for weight loss and diabetes, so I'm not sure which way to go. I think we've covered a lot of this already, actually. I'm sure Monique has heard us, um, but um, let's talk about vegetarian sources of fat for a moment, because that's one we haven't touched on so much. Nuts, seeds, avocados, how do those fit into the picture here when we're talking about diabetes? Yeah, well, we want, we want a little bit of fat, but not too much. So um, you, you definitely don't want to overdo it on, on the fat, even if, it's, uh, even if it's vegan fat. So like for nuts, for example, if uh, you're going to use them as a condiment, not as a snack. So what you can hold in the palm of your hand, that's about all you should have in a whole day um, at the most. So that's, that's it for nuts. Um, avocados, you know, a slice of a, maybe a quarter of an avocado, that would be a good serving for a day, especially if you're dealing with what you're dealing with and trying to, to reduce. The main thing is, is load up with those non-starchy vegetables. The vegetables and the greens and the legumes uh, just have that displace everything else on your plate. And that is what's going to bring you huge results to the extent that that takes over your plate you're going to see the results directly. And for God's sake, eliminate dairy. You know, if you're a pescatarian, you're, you're following that path, that's fine. You know, and just kind of grow through that, explore the whole food plant-based approach, but get rid of dairy. It's, the, it's like the worst thing you can do. It's like eating fried food. It's, it's not a good thing. Why? Well, the, the dairy, the saturated fat in the dairy is one of the key contributors to clogging up the blood cells, to clogging up that key that the insulin is trying to get in there and unlock to be able to process the sugar. And, and dairy is one of the worst contributors to that. And then eggs, of course, high, high in fat and cholesterol, you know, giving you the same kind of problem. So, um, you know, I wouldn't be afraid of whole plant food starch. Okay, the benefits in the whole plant foods are way, you know, it, it's balanced out with the full matrix of the food. It has all the fiber. So we need all of that. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I have people going through having, a, you know, say, McDougal, you're probably talking about a starch-based diet. They're reversing diabetes night and day. And people are going through the whole food plant-based with maybe uh, less starch they're reducing diabetes. So either path is going to be okay for you. Just see what, what fits your needs. Either way, it's basing it around whole plant foods. It's just yes. different strategies. Yes, lots of, of vegetables and lots of legumes. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about sugars for a second, though. Um, clearly, um, excess sugar consumption is not a health, healthy choice for anybody. And even if uh, a, a non-diabetic person can metabolize sugar effectively without it spiking their blood sugar levels, 
um, it's still going to be harder on your system if you eat a lot of sugar, right? And we know that sugar is associated with metabolic syndrome. It's probably also associated with higher rates of obesity and diabetes. Uh, and I, I'm talking about cause, not just symptom here. So, uh, but we also know that, that fruit might be another story. So what's your take on sweets and which kinds of sweets are uh, safe for somebody who is concerned about blood sugar balance? If you're concerned about blood sugar balance, eliminate refined sugar out of your whole diet, period, end of statement. It's, it's a drug. Yeah. Um, so when we're talking about sugar, when I'm talking about sugar, I'm talking about that white crystal. All right. That is toxic poison. Get rid of it. Um, as far as fruit, do not compare sugar in the same sentence. Refined sugar and fruit from, um, and sugar from fruit in its whole matrix and glucose, uh, do not compare those two. It's completely unrelated. Um, and fruit and sugar from the glucose that you get from fruit and all of the benefits of the antioxidants and the full matrix of the food and the vitamins and the minerals and everything that you get is totally healing to your body. Okay, You've, it's, uh, there, you just can't compare them. So make sure that you understand the difference between you know, carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates and complex carbohydrates and fiber and not fiber. You just stick with a wide variety of whole natural foods, legumes and grains and greens and beans and fruit, and you can't go wrong. Thank you. Bethany said, where would you tell people to start? I've been reading The Food Revolution, which has opened my eyes, and finding a starting point to launch a healthier lifestyle has been difficult. Thank you for sharing your journey. What's the, what's the first step? For, for diabetes? Sure. Um, yeah, it, the first step is go, you want to go to a whole food, plant-based diet. And the first step to moving toward that diet is the whole food part. And the whole food part now is going to imply you throwing out all of the processed foods in your pantry. And that is sugar and flour and packaged goods. Um, and definitely, uh, you know, as many animal products as you can, certainly all of the deli and cold cuts and meats and red meat and all of that. Um, you want to eliminate and dairy specifically and fried foods. Just start with that. If you did that and then replace that plate with whole foods um, and vegetables and fruits, you're, you're going to be on your way. You're going to see results immediately within days. Awesome. How important is exercise? Okay. So fitness is in made in the gym. Weight loss is made in the kitchen. So I want, I want to communicate that very clearly. As important as movement and exercise is, it's been overemphasized as the pathway to getting in shape and, and losing weight and burning off the calories, and it's not true. That, that path is in your kitchen and what you eat, what's in your pantry, and what you put in your mouth. Okay. As far as movement goes, as simple as, as, as a 30 or 40-minute walk, if you're get, just getting going, is enough movement to uh, to – to reap all of the benefits. I lost all of this weight, the majority of it, and I hadn't been exercised. I didn't exercise for months into my weight loss journey. So movement is, it's critical, it's important. I want you to move. I want you to put your hands over your head. We hardly ever have our hands over our head, our shoulders, you know, and our scapula, and we're moving the fascia that starts to get in keys. We want yeah. to move, but I don't want you to think that the moving is losing your weight. The moving is, the, the movement is, is making the energy and, and your blood flow throughout your system. And just walk. If you can walk, if the minimum you do when you start out is just to walk 10 minutes after each meal, that's a huge start. That's enough for you to start get, reaping all the benefits. And then increase that walk to the point where you walk in 20 minutes and then an hour a day. And then, and then, and then you're off to the races, literally. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Well, we're nearing the end of our time, John. And so I want to ask you, um, is there anything more that we haven't already said that you think is important for our participants to hear? Yes. Community and connection. You were not meant to do this alone. And I don't want you to wait until you have it together. I don't want you to wait until you're in the clothes that you want to be or wait until you want to be in the place that you want to be or, or I don't want you to be afraid to ask for help. I don't want you to feel alone. You don't have to do this by yourself. 
you're not alone. There's nothing wrong with you. I want you to find community and connection. You've got that here with the Food Revolution Network and the group, and that is the core. It's the, it's the linchpin. It's the underlying key to success is being with like-minded people on the same journey that you can relate to, that have the same struggles that you do, that, and for you to help others that are maybe a couple steps behind you. That, that whole flow is going to keep you on this path. This is a lifestyle. It's an identity. Thank you. And that is a perfect segue to what I want to say next, which is this is a uh, broadcast that is part of Whole Life Club. So we're sharing it with our whole Food Revolution Network community and thrilled to do so. And if you feel like you're learning something here that you want to take further and, and you're not already a member, I want to let you know what this opportunity is so you can consider if it's right for you. Whole Life Club is an ongoing community. We provide recipes, we provide wisdom, and we provide community. It's a network of more than 6,000 people right now who are standing up and learning to get empowered and apply this. At the end of the day, it isn't what you know that matters, it's what you do. And so if you want to implement, if you want results, not just for a day or a week or a month, but for your whole life, then that's why we created Whole Life Club. So every week you get a new batch of fabulous whole foods plant-powered recipes, you get menu planning ideas and resources. You get a community where you can ask your questions, share your struggles and your challenges, share your victories and your celebrations, get support from moderators and myself and our whole leadership team. You, you also get wisdom. You can participate in our action hours. You can submit questions in advance so that we can to respond to the specific concerns that you have. You get the transcripts, you get the follow-up action checklist. So for example, from today, you'll hear specific bullet points of some of the top tips that John has recommended. And so you don't have to take notes during these action hours. You'll have the transcripts and the sort of cliff notes, if you will, through the action checklist. You get all of that and you get a weekly action of the week video from me where I talk about a simple step you can take. You get a weekly checklist and every month we've got a theme. So this month we're focusing on blood sugar balance and uh, reversing or preventing diabetes and diabetes and how you can have a healthy blood sugar balance. We've had focuses on cancer prevention, on heart health, on um, energy and peak performance. Uh, so many different themes and they all have one central goal. We wanna help you get results. We wanna help you land the plane. So if this sounds good to you and you're not already a member, then please check it out. There's a link right on this page. You can learn more. You can find out how you can join in Whole Life Club for your whole life. Uh, and John, I just want to say thank you. I know you're building community too. We're, we, no, we don't have to do this alone. And your story is such a heartening, inspiring example of what's possible, no matter what we're going through, no matter how much suffering or struggle we might be facing, there is always hope. There is always the opportunity to take a stand and say, you know what, this will be my pivot point. This will be my moment of transformation and I am never gonna be the same again. And you have made that choice and you are inspiring so many of us. Not all of us have the level of challenge that you did, uh, a couple years back, but all of us have challenges and all of us can make choices and changes as you have. So I wanna thank you so much for your inspiring example and your leadership and your wisdom for taking the time to get informed and to share what you've been learning with all of us. It's an honor and a privilege to work with you. I love supporting I Thrive and your whole, your whole outreach. And we're so glad that you took the time to join and share your wisdom with us today. Well, Ocean, it's a pleasure to be here, and I love the Food Revolution Network, and I love your community. Thank you so much. This is Ocean Robbins and John McMahon thanking you so much for joining in this whole life action hour and wishing you fabulous food and fabulous health and fabulous vitality and balanced blood sugar and a thriving life now and every day of your life. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a beautiful day. When it comes to cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease, and other chronic illness, what really matters isn't how many books you read, how many webinars you attend, or how much you know. What really matters at the end of the day is what you eat and how you live. The science has given us what we need to know. Now it's time for action. It's time to implement and optimize your healthy lifestyle. It's time to get results. It's time to say goodbye to confusion and hello to clarity. It's time to say goodbye to bad habits 
and hello to good ones. It's time to fall in love with foods that love you back. It's time to join a community that will support you in achieving your goals. It's time for Whole Life Club. Click the link to find out more and to join in now.